Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from the University of Iowa and from international programs. We're broadcasting tonight from the Senate Chamber of the Old Capitol Museum on the campus of the University of Iowa, and this is the first program in this year's season of World Canvas. Our topic tonight is the arts as vocabulary, and we have a wonderful group of guests that we'll welcome in just a moment here. Uh, I would like to take a moment, though, to thank our partners, uh, not only international programs, but also the Pentecost Museums, KRUI Radio, and the Hawkeye Network. On tonight's program, we'll be exploring ways in which the arts, both the performing and the creative arts, provide a vocabulary for self-expression and communication across barriers of all kinds. Our particular focus is the arts and human rights tonight. And I'm pleased to say that these folks on the left have uh, put together an initiative that, are, that, that I think uh, will be very interesting for anyone who has a chance to come see performing arts here on the campus of the University of Iowa in this uh, upcoming year. Uh, joining me on stage are Alan McVeigh, just to my left. Hi, Alan. Uh, he is the director of the UI Division of Performing Arts. John Manning is next to Alan. Hi, John. Hi. Thank you. Uh, John, is an as John is an associate professor in the University of Iowa School of Music. And on the far end, we have Kelsey Kramer, who is a graduate student in the School of Music. And she's also a representative of the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights. So thank you for coming, Kelsey. Um, this is a big topic, as we can all imagine, and what I'd like to really investigate throughout the four parts of this series is how the arts help us see things we haven't seen or under thing, understand things we haven't understood or maybe haven't really wanted to get too close to. Um, how is it that art holds the power to challenge accepted beliefs and maybe even effect change? Um, so we'll be trying to answer some of those questions throughout this uh, full series, but I'd like to start with you, Alan, if I may, to just ask you how the arts got started here at the University of Iowa. Well, it's a good question. Uh, if you think back 100 years or so, the arts were barely present anywhere in American education or really world education. They were present as history or dramatic literature or perhaps study of music uh, academically, but they didn't exist. And you, you sort of ask yourself, why not? Uh, they were obviously important. And it's hard to know exactly why not, except that changing an institution like a university is a little like trying to guide a battleship. It just takes a long time. People know what they know, and they're not sure about other things. And I think the arts are sometimes, uh, they're mysterious. Uh, they don't have clear outcomes, necessarily. Uh, they are meant to ask questions rather than give answers. Um, and they're not the forte of the people who were in the universities at that time. So Iowa, like most places at that time, had uh, some arts, but they weren't in the curriculum. Uh, for example, in theater, there were uh, clubs, and quite a number of clubs, seven or eight clubs that did plays and musicals and sketches and that sort of thing. Uh, in music, there were what they called affiliated lessons. Uh, where the university didn't collect tuition, but rather the money went directly to people who offered uh, instruments or even voice, but they weren't for credit. Uh, in art, there was an odd thing uh, where, where people were asked to, I think, do a little hand drawing as a part of a course, but that was, that was about it. Uh, and in writing, uh, there was no creative writing at that time. Now, part of my, what I want to say here is that institutions, uh, like political institutions, are made and changed by people. It seems like, well, the University of Iowa has developed such and such a thing, and, and it has. And you have to give credit to the whole institution for that. But the fact is that there are individual people who brought these things about. And one of the first ones here was a, was a dean of the graduate college named Carl Seashore. And he believed that writing was an important thing for people to learn and not just writing a little poem, which is what some of them were doing. And so he not only brought uh, in that into the curriculum, he actually uh, made it a degree-granting program, which was one of the very first degree-granting programs uh, in the arts anywhere in the world. Meanwhile, in theater, uh, they hired a man named E.C. Maybe, and Mr. Maybe came, and his, his job was to do something with these seven clubs and to teach speech. Speech was understood to be an important thing to do. So, but he, after one year here, he said, this is not yet at all. We're going to make a, a, a department. We're going to make a department of speech and of, of drama. And he did. He pulled those clubs together. He made some classes. And he started what became an amazing department that at one time included speech, theater, radio, film, eventually 
television, communication studies, communication disorders, all those were in one place. Not only that, he, he branched out and created uh, nationally uh, what became American, uh, what is it, theater institution, I forgot exactly what it is, uh, worked with the federal theater, theater. So he was an amazing man. Meanwhile, in music, uh, they hired P.G. Uh, Clapp, and he came in and he st started with eight people, and now it's 58 people, <laughs> in a little building that had a few rooms, and now they've, well, now they have a little building with a few rooms. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, they're going to eventually have a fabulous building, and I'll get to that in a minute. And he, he did. He built up a, a department um, in uh, art, and Ab and others know more about this than I do, but they had a man named Charles Cumming, who came in and then began to bring professional artists, uh, active artists here to campus, including Grant Wood. And he uh, created what eventually became the School of Art and Art History, one of the very first institutions that pulled together art and art history. And in creative writing, Mr. Seashore started it. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Engel uh, created the world's uh, greatest uh, creative writing program ever. Mm -hmm. These things didn't happen quickly. They didn't happen easily. But people joined in. They supported them. And it came to be, to be. And yeah. to end this little history lesson, uh, the 2008 flood uh, damaged uh, so many buildings and these departments. And the university didn't have to say what it said. They could have said, uh, will we rebuild these things in a much more modest way? Because in fact, the buildings that were getting a lot of money from FEMA, there's not nearly enough money from FEMA to, to do what we need to do. And so uh, President Mason, uh, and the, the, the provost at the time, and the, everybody since then has committed themselves to something pretty astonishing, which is not only to rebuild the arts, but to make them really better than ever. It's a, it was quite a journey, and one that I'm very proud to be a part of. Yeah. certain way of doing things. You'll see it in the determination of our students, in the classroom and on our fields, in the collaboration among our faculty that lead to great innovation and change, in the vision of our writers, artists, and doctors. Bringing the world to Iowa and Iowa to the world. It's the Hawkeye Way. so happy that you could give us a little walkthrough because yeah. this has been an amazing century of, yes, yes. Uh, of arts involvement here on campus and, and it leads us into what I want to ask you about specifically John because I know that you discussed with Alan um, this project called SOAR, Series on Arts and Rights, um, to see whether there was a way to discuss, I shouldn't say so much discuss, but to sort of present human rights um, 
questions or issues uh, to the public here during a, a year of performance in music and theater and dance and so on. Was there a way to do that with, uh, within the division? Um, so why was this something you wanted to do? Well, I was inspired by <clears throat> the uh, Center for Human Rights. And Kelsey had a lot to do with that. Um, there was a Martin Luther King Day of Service two years ago where I attended um, a seminar, a workshop, on human rights in the curriculum. Just out of curiosity and human interest, I had the day off. <laughs> so I went and um, I was fascinated, I was enthralled, I was inspired, but I kept thinking, but why am I here? Well, how can I use this? I'm, I'm a professor of music and I'm a performer on tuba and I, I play in a brass quintet. And I thought, well, maybe there's a way we can use this as a theme for either a concert or a recording or eventually I thought maybe some kind of series, maybe a year long theme um, that would kind of uh, go throughout some of the many performances that go on in the division. And uh, I suggested it to someone and uh, Alan uh, has uh, a lot of inspiring uh, programs and vision for our division and suggested that, uh, I originally suggested, well, how about the School of Music? How do how we do that? And immediately Alan said, let's do this division-wide. And I was a little overwhelmed. But um, it's actually a, a pretty easy thing to translate, especially to theater arts and to dance, of course to music, to embed some kind of message of human rights. Awareness, um, there are so many artists, musicians, composers, choreographers, who were affected by human rights, whether they had to live in exile, whether they had, um, were persecuted, whether they were imprisoned or exiled, uh, not to mention the thousands of works that chose as a subject, such as Slaughter City, uh, with a human rights theme that's explicit, and this is exactly what the lesson is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. The difficult thing with music is that, unless it's program music uh, or vocal music, it's hard to say, well, this piece is exactly about this. So one of the challenges I faced as an instrumental performer was trying to choose music that might have some kind of connection. And I think I have a few ideas, and several of my colleagues have some great ideas, and we're thrilled that each, each of the units in the division are doing something special, mm -hmm. and all sorts of new things are percolating to the surface, which I'm thrilled about. Yeah, that's great. Can you share one or two of those ideas you have for some of the music you Sure. Uh, Kitty Eberly uh, on our vocal department is doing a recital of patriotic and war songs very soon. Mark Heidel with the symphony band, uh, they're using, uh, they're programming one of the pieces in their symphony band concert, uh, and it's a tribute to Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. It's a piece uh, by Mark Camphouse about Rosa Parks. Um, I'm probably more focused on the music side yeah. of things, yeah. but there's a faculty and, and um, graduate recital in February uh, by the dance department where there'll be themes of human rights. Mm. So um, I just kind of dropped a seed and I wanted to see what would happen and these beautiful yeah. plants are coming out. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. And uh, Alan, when you spoke, spoke to your colleagues in um, the other, the non-music areas of the division, uh, was there immediate, oh yeah, absolutely. There was, yes. Yeah. People thought it was a really good idea. It was John's idea entirely. I tried to okay. set out there, what, what would we like to do yeah. next year as a division? And uh, he came up with this idea, and yeah. it, it was a good one from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll get to Kelsey in just one sec, because I'm, I'm anxious to hear about the Center for Human Rights and your work there. But um, uh, in terms of the division itself or a university, what does human rights have to do with the division of performing arts? I mean, why, why, why should you take this on as a concept, if not cause? Well, what is art finally about at the, at the most fundamental level is the heart and the, you know, the, our spirit. And um, what is that all about? It's, I think, perhaps most about reaching out to other people. You know, when you have a, a great joy or a great sorrow, you share that. You need to share that with other people. And if you have a great love, it's only realized if you, if you reach. Yeah. And so I think when we create art, whether it's a painting or it's a 
a piece of music. In the end, it's, it's about this. And when we see so many of our fellow human beings in such difficult straits, I think our heart, our spirit goes out and we want to reach. It's not true for every work of art, but I think it's true for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Show your Iowa pride, the Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. The ultimate collection of Iowa Hawkeye merchandise, gifts, and apparel. Help support the University of Iowa. All proceeds benefit men's and women's athletic teams and student programs. The Iowa Hawk Shop, where Iowa shops. Show your Iowa pride. Call 1-800-HAWK-SHOP or visit www.hawkshop.com. We have a certain way of doing things. You'll see it in the determination of our students, in the classroom and on our fields, in the collaboration among our faculty that lead to great innovation and change, in the vision of our writers, artists, and doctors. Bringing the world to Iowa and Iowa to the world. It's the Hawkeye way. Kelsey Kramer, um, I'm particularly grateful to you for, for bringing this idea to me so that we could present such a program on World Canvas. And, and you have worked for quite a long time as a graduate assistant in the Center for Human Rights. And I know now you're a musicology graduate student. Um, tell me, please, why this is a project that has special meaning for you. Sure. Well, um, gosh, I've been working for the Center for Human Rights longer than I've been a grad student here. I started there um, as an AmeriCorps volunteer. Um, and then stayed on to oversee their certificate program in human rights, which is an undergraduate certificate program, um, and decided to pursue my degree in musicology. And so I sort of have two hats at the university, I guess. And um, so this project has been particularly meaningful to me because it lets me wear both at the same time. So um, it's been an interesting um, path to see them come together. But um, for me, it... Um, Let's me combine the two under this idea that there's some connection between beauty and justice. And so my work at the Center for Human Rights focuses so much on social justice. And um, I decided to pursue a degree in musicology because I love music, um, particularly sacred music. I love um, the beauty of it. I love the history of it. Um, but I also love this idea that it speaks to something um, very human and expresses something about the human spirit that um, that other, other things can't. I think that's true of the arts in general. And so I think for that reason, they're particularly relevant to a discussion of human rights um, in a very different way than what um, legal frameworks are relevant to human rights, but I think they're equally important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned that you study sacred music. Mm -hmm. So is, is there some, some piece you might be able to bring forward for the audience that, that can uh, help explain 
what you see, the, how you see this connection between beauty and justice. Is there a particular piece or a particular composer that you think has made that connection with sacred music that's, that's we're trying to talk about? Oh gosh, I don't know if I could think of a particular piece. I think, um, I think I notice it um, in, in what we think of when we think of beautiful music. We notice that there's balance and there's rightness. And that's not to say that, um, that very dissonant music can't also say something about human rights. But um, for me, when I'm—it sounds really cheesy—but when I'm watching a movie and there's a beautifully written score that I know is is messing with my emotions, there's a reason that that works for me. Um, and, and I think that that's I think that that's important. But in the same way, I think that um, the dissonant music does express something about human rights and social justice as well. The fact that dissonance and something striking can make you um, question why does this strike me this way? Why is this wrong? And do I want to fix it, or um, do I just want to acknowledge and and share in whatever suffering that's mm -hmm. coming out of? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as I understand it, Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that uh, art should promote understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations, racial or religious groups. Um, does that ring true for you? I mean, is this, we're talking about human rights and we haven't really made an effort to explain what we think they are, and maybe the explanation is a little bit different for each of us, but the ability to freely express what you feel through music, through a uh, theater piece, uh, through something that you write, uh, dance, um, is I guess what they're getting at here in this declaration, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it resonates uh, f for the whole theme and the artist's vocabulary um, is a great way to frame that because um, the one thing that's universal worldwide besides our humanity is our emotion. And emotions are often tied to reactions to art. And we may not speak the same language, i.e. vocabulary, uh, but we do have the same feelings and reactions. And I, I think that speaks a lot to the universality of this human condition and how art reflects it. We have a certain way of doing things. You'll see it in the determination of our students, in the classroom and on our fields, in the collaboration among our faculty that lead to great innovation and change, in the vision of our writers, artists, and doctors. Bringing the world to Iowa and Iowa to the world. It's the Hawkeye way. Tradition, mm -hmm. ambition, exploration, inspiration. You feel it when you step on campus at the University of Iowa. The energy and pride of students inspired by our history and excited about our future. When you join the Hawkeye family, you're a part of it all. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a part of it. Be a Hawkeye.
Well, I think a little later in the segment, we are in this uh, program, we may have um, some discussion about this whole business where um, a, a massive event in world history, some cataclysmic, horrible thing that is too much really even for words, uh, can sometimes be brought to a level of understanding that an individual person can, you know, if you think of something like Sophie's Choice, such a terrible, uh, unimaginable, um, situation, the Holocaust, but when, when you see one or two people's journeys through something so terrible, uh, individuals can identify in a way that is sometimes hard to do, I think, through political discussion or through um, reading dense texts. Sometimes it's a song or it's a moment uh, on screen or it's an uttered phrase on, on the stage. And you're all artists. This is a, probably part of what's brought you into the fields you're you're in today. Um, have you ever put together a dramatic work that, uh, does something come to mind now, a piece that you shaped in this um, field? No, maybe, but yeah. let me, I, so something you said made me think about a, a, a little selection in uh, Zorba the Greek, the novel by Cousin Zakis. And in that book, there's a, and it's in the movie too, a wonderful movie. Uh, if, you, if you've seen the movie, you remember Alan Bates plays a a young writer, and, and uh, Anthony Quinn plays Zorba. And there's a point in which Anthony Quinn, is, is Zorba, his, his family, I, I don't remember exactly what happened. Somebody's killed. It's a horrible, horrible event for his family. And he turns to this writer and he says, what good is your art when it comes up against this terrible thing? And Alan Bates's character is of course silenced for a minute because the question is absolutely right. And all he can say is, in art, we learn that others have felt what we have felt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're not alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So um, we should be looking for uh, programs throughout the performing arts this year mm -hmm. that will have a tie to human rights and sh should we expect that there'll be discussions um, given in conjunction with some of these pieces? Do you know whether there'll some be? Some will be very informal. Yeah. Some will be centered around it and some it will just be a peripheral theme, mm -hmm. maybe mentioned in the program notes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey might have a, uh, a link to some of the um, other events that might have a tie into uh, discussion and panels and mm -hmm. seminars. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's always amazing to see how much is going on at the university that connects with this idea of human rights and social justice um, that we can connect to. And as the Center for Human Rights, we sort of try to, to watch for those and approach those people and say, have you thought about this connection? And it's always amazing to see um, how that exists and people don't always know. So we're doing similar things with the School of Music and the other divisions, um, the other schools and Division of Performing Arts as well. So. That's great. And the Center for Human Rights has a new home in the College yes, of Law. We do. And so yes. moving forward with, uh, I, I know, a lot of new energy. And that's great. Yes, we're very excited. Yeah, it's great. Thank you very much for joining us for this first segment of a four part series called The Arts is Vocabulary. This is World Canvas. I'm Joan Kerr, and we hope you can join us next time. Thanks, and good night. Thank you.